I'm going to introduce Carissa Carmen. Her teaching and artistic work are extensions of her passion for collaboration and sustainable practices in the arts. Her most recent project, Caravan, was a collaboration with 20 university students to design and fabricate a large-scale natural dye fabric chandelier installed in a public performance venue at the 2015 Lotus World Music and Arts Festival in downtown Bloomington, Indiana. Caravan was part of her work in Color Field, a partnership with IU's Hilltop Garden and Nature Center and with textile artist and indigo grower Roland Ricketts to cultivate color and community by growing natural dyes. She has also collaborated on the New York-based WaterPod project, an ecosystem and domicile constructed on a barge that traveled to ports throughout the city, providing access and programming as an event and education site. As an individual artist, Carissa has exhib exhibited nationally and internationally, and she's currently a professor in textiles at IU Bloomington. Hi, everybody. Um, I haven't done an arts in the park project before, but I know Luann, um, from uh, Bloomington, Indiana, where I teach as a professor in um, fine arts textiles. And um, I really don't like being a solitary studio artist. I've never been. And um, I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit of my practice, which is um, kind of a combination of a lot of things. And I'm going to kind of use this, some images and some of the projects to kind of show you how I use sight as sort, sort of like a creative venture in my art making and in my teaching. Um, and so as I'm kind of starting, this is kind of my thinking. As you can say, see, it looks a little bit chaotic, but it's always flowing, meaning everything always connects to the next thing. So within this, there's a lot of containment. So with textiles, I see as craft and making, the, real, the handmade, really getting your hands into it, which then I think relates to cottage in industry. Cottage industry, flows into DIY, learning how to do everything yourself, which then kind of jets you forward into being a pioneer. That lends itself to low toxicity, sustainable practices, which then requires more skills and more technology, which then forces you to seek out collaboration. That collaboration can jet you out into conceptual practice, which can both streamline you into fine art, or slight absurdity, which the absurdity can take you back to sight, which brings you back to portability, which we talked a little bit about with permanence, that then brings you back to material knowledge, which then continues the flow again. And um, I just wanted to show a picture of my studio practice. I'm, that's not too dissimilar to my chart, which means that I'm thinking <laughs> about a lot of things all the time. And, but what I'm really passionate about is I think everything connects. I think that table connects to what I'm doing on the next table to the next table. So I really like to think compartmentally, and I believe that they all flow together. Um, um, I just had this really nice, uh, uh, this is a PDF that I sent Luann to send you. It's from Making Your Life as an Artist. It's one of like the most pragmatic and sensible books about, or publication about making your life as an artist. And this is one of the quotes in there. The secret of artists who make it work is they use the skills, resourcefulness, and creativity of their art practice in all aspects of their lives. Got it. So I'm just going to go through a handful of projects. I'm going to just talk about them pretty briefly in case you have more detailed questions. Um, and I'm just going to show this is how I first started working with Sight, which is a project I did over 12 years ago. This was a bathroom in an internship house that I was living at, making $100 a month. Oh gosh, that's horrifying. And we took, on, we took on the house as an art project. So here on the left, we were working in a ceramics facility. I handmade new black and white tiles, dried them, glazed them, and then I re, re, we did a series of repairs and art installations in, in the house. So it's just my first time I've ever worked on a specific site. But as you can see, I didn't match the tiles. Do you see that? I didn't want it to look exactly like the original. I wanted to have my own input on it. So I would say this is kind of how I work. I want to follow the rules of tile making. I want to make them myself. But I also want to shake up the rules, but maintain it being very functional. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, and this is another project called uh, Moving In, where we drew all of the objects in our house. We, re we projected them onto a gallery wall, and we moved into the gallery with the domestic items that would bring us comfort. So just looking at drawing practices, projecting, having false senses of home and comfort. Um, and then my first really specific project that was, that was um, called The Great Speckled Bird. And The Great Speckled Bird was a newspaper for a small town. The newspaper was delivered over the course of two months of living in a small town. It was the first time I wrote it in a grant, and when I got there, I actually did the entire project that I proposed. And they said, you mean you're going to do the project you proposed? And I said, well, yeah, isn't that why you propose it? <laughs> so they were kind of surprised, but um, the, the <laughs> strangely enough, but the, um, the newspaper was a way of connecting the artist community living in the small town to the local community. And so over the course of the six weeks that I was there, two months, I devised a six-week um, newspaper, which was a hand-drawn, photocopied edition. And I created a newspaper route, and I delivered it. It was called the Almost Always Sunday paper because the photocopier in town, there was only one, was closed on Sunday. So if I didn't get it in by Saturday at 5, I had to wait till Monday. And so what I did is throughout the town is I, I was really the... I took the role of being the newspaper printer, but also the researcher of the town. So I would talk with people, find out new stories, lores, feature small businesses, go to all the local events in town because I had to feature them in the paper, talk to people that were fishing, talk to people that were climbing up mountains. Somebody spotted a bear in the town, big news. Um, uh, things that were being baked in the town, someone had a party that they wanted to talk about. So I would just try to feature what I thought was local news to everybody. The goal was everybody likes news. <laughs> I was pretty unanimous. I never announced myself as a newspaper writer, but people slowly started connecting the dots and they really loved it when they were featured in the paper. Um, so that was my first time I ever really went specifically to the site. The town was the shape of a T. One street this way, one street that way. Very small town, maybe 1,200 people. And the newspaper was the talk of a town. But not at first. It wasn't the talk of the town until maybe the fourth week. But my goal was to keep really strong and steady and create a slow building movement. Um, and then I said, oh, I love working this way. This is a project for this town. This project could never happen anywhere. I said, this is like pulling everything I do together. And I can be really professional about making my own newspaper, right? So this is a list of things that I think is really, I've become, I've really enjoyed about being really specific to site, which is identifying one's own skill, finding the confidence to develop professional resources, seeing every project as a job. I know as an artist, you're saying, oh, I'm an artist. And people say, oh, you paint, right? And I said, well, no, it's my job. <laughs> I'm actually, that's my job. And so when I do these projects, I kind of take the no notion like, this project is my new job. So I, if you approach it like that you can call anybody you need to and say, I'm doing this job and I need your help with this, people respect you completely differently than if you say, I have this um, idea. So the approach of like taking this uh, project as a job has really been helpful for me. Mapping out how each site provides logistics and using those logistics as parameters. Um, also the ability to creatively solve a problem, which I love to do, which is why I also want to be a pioneer in DIY. So looking at how I can always solve. The problem I was solving with the newspaper was that the artist community, excuse me, the artist community didn't talk to the locals. So the solving was trying to get them to mix. Um, and then recognizing each site's community, which is also your audience, and then using site specificity as a way to channel your creative vision. Um, so then I'll just show you Caravan, which was um, a partnership with the Lotus World Music and Arts Festival. Um, this was the final installation. They have what they call their main stage, and their main stage is this a really beautiful, enormous tent. This is the entrance to the tent, and the stage is at the end. Um, and I worked with um, my a semesters, two semesters 
of students to create this fabric chandelier. Now what you might not be able to tell is how big this is. It's 24 feet by 16 feet deep. Um, and I have this little chart that I made. Um, I don't, won't go over all of them in, in a lot of detail, but what I did realize is all of my projects take on all of these four details in some way. They always consider the audience. They always consider some sort of really distinct parameters. They always have to have some sort of support other than myself. And they always are collaborating with somebody. So for the caravan, the audience was festival goers and musicians. Now what it doesn't say is that festival goers are from all over Indiana, all different age groups. The parameters were, we had a very specific budget. I had to figure out a way to get the project to fit into my regular student curriculum. Like I still had to teach the students how to do natural dyeing, but I kind of had to change the rules a little bit, kind of like tiling the floor wrong. Um, and also, it was summer season, was peak season for harvesting natural dyes, so I had to work around the time parameter, which means I had to have a summer class. And then what natural dye colors were available. Now the support was from volunteers, the students that I had in both a summer school class and in the fall session. Also, I had an assistant in textiles that summer. I never get an assistant for the summer. I just so happened to have an assistant to do a lot of helpful work. And then I also had a fabulous woodshop technician who wasn't that busy over the summer. The collaboration was with Lotus World Music and Arts Festival and a deep collaboration with the students. Our goal was to create a collective working environment where all of the students could feel like they have contributed to the design, creation, and problem solving of a large scale installation. So my goal was not to say, this is my project. The goal was to say, hey, this is gonna be our project. You guys design it. I'll help make less problems for us, potentially. Um, so we, um, the Lotus Music Arts Festival had a large exhibition called Seeing Red, which was using all natural dyes, natural red dyes. So that was kind of the impetus. I said, you're, if you're gonna do an, a, a red themed Lotus, I can do red theme. It doesn't have to be the same red theme. I can work off of that. So it kind of gave me a framework. I said, I love red dyes. Let's figure out a way to make red dyes really more interesting. Um, and then this is natural dyeing. Um, I have a list of some of the dyes that we use. I grow natural dyes in our campus garden. This is marigolds and this is matter root. So looking at, we actually got in there, we were brewing natural dyes with the students. Now, I do have an amazing textile studio. <laughs> So this was something that I, could only happen in a textiles course on, that, on this scale. Now the students' job were to create their own colors. I wasn't going to tell them what to do. I said, you find, you have to make a color that's in the lights, darks, or, or mediums. Go. You can use any of these plants on this list to make any, col any color combination. So kind of giving them, you experiment. You tell me what's a beautiful color instead of telling them the recipe and having them following it. So having them be a collaborator. And um, having a student, you know, here she is, she's designing it on the computer, helping us to figure out how it's going to look in the, uh, in the end final results. And then here's the map of our layout. Um, we had a, well, I had a student as I hired as a welder that fit into the budget. And we also, um, we had the technical assistant. So we used the CNC router to do a digital file to actually create the arc very mathematical. What I think is really helpful is knowing who those assistants are and then knowing what their skill set is. For instance, one of the assistants said, oh, I just, I just learned AutoCAD. Do you want me to draw those arcs in the whole prototype? And I said, why, yes. <laughs> I do not know AutoCAD. You know, there's, so, there's only so much you can learn. And so she, she said, well, I'm hired here for the summer. What do you need me to do? And I said, AutoCAD this arc. So, I, so it really helps to know their skill level. Um, and it really helps move things. Now, based on what they know how to do is what we use. Now, if they didn't know how to do it, we wouldn't do it that way. So it just was circumstances to who I was working with. So here's us installing the work. We have it on these aluminum pieces, all kind of all hands on deck. You know, the students were actually really savvy actually. Some students had walked in here and never, ever worked with textiles, ever before in their life. They didn't know how to sew, they didn't know how to dye, 
And so what would happen is they kind of developed, you know, some of the more uh, adventurous students kind of dove right in and kind of modeled how to do it better. Um, dying really evenly is really hard when you have a lot of cloth. I mean, it's like your whole body's rinsing and um, everyone kind of taught each other, but I gave them a lot of freedom. And I think they, they thanked me for the freedom because I wasn't, I said, oh, it looks a little modeled, keep dying, <laughs> just keep dying. It's not about, at this point, we were not about quality, we're about you learning through the project and then creating, creating an illusion. So this is fabric and we, sorry, I did, probably never said that it was fabric. Um, and we didn't, we ordered, part of our budget was actually all fabric and maybe a couple, you know, it was like a thousand dollars in fabric and four hundred dollars in dye, four or five hundred dollars in actual dye extracts and then we had about 500, it was a $2,000 budget, 2000, and about $500 to build, you know, just enough for the wood and the aluminum rods. But that was it. Like, we were on a super tight budget. So I said, let's make this fabric go really far. And so this was a three-day installation. So we had the install day. We had, to, we had this, like, forklift. What do they call them? <laughs> Cherry picker, which we didn't know how to use. So we had to, you know, plan some time to, like, figure out how to, use these, I mean, how to use a cherry picker, you know, because you're in theater, um, figure out how to use the cherry picker. No one could get hurt. We're, we had to actually hoist it into the air over 26 feet. It was a very, and, you know, I talked with engineers, I talked with other artists, I said, how am I going to get this up high? Who do I have, who, who is going to be there to help me? And they said, oh, well, the people that are in, installing the tents, they'll, they'll be there. And I said, well, how much will they do for me? Because I can't get up to that 20. There's a 26-foot post up there that I need to hang the hanger. Who's going to hang it? So I got there early. I kind of negotiated. They said, we'll hang up the metal posts if you can get your structure up. So we used a pulley system, a very low-tech pulley system, thankfully, right? <laughs> pulley system, all four corners. It was pretty lightweight. Now, the thing about fabric is it's really portable but it takes a lot of time to install. So a lot of the installation was while we were there. Um, but what the success was, was that a lot of hands were in it and they all really all collectively built the parts that then built the whole. 